Science, Technology, Engineering, Mathematics. STEM. STEM chatter has been going on a long time in education circles, and it's something that obsesses many people. Presidents, education secretaries, university officials, even superintendents, school board members, you look at people who are advising countries on how to develop their economies, they talk about STEM education. It's everywhere. Given how ubiquitous this conversation around STEM is, it's easy to think that it's just this sort of timeless conversation that's been going on in education circles. But a better way to think about it might be to think about how it has come and gone in waves, at least in the US. One particular high point of our conversation around STEM in the US happened after the Soviet Union launched the Sputnik satellite in 1957. That set off a whole set of anxieties in the US about how we weren't training enough science, uh, scientists and engineers in order to defeat the Soviet Union's and win the Cold War. The conversation was about national security, how STEM could help improve our chances of beating those darn Russians. Now that the Soviet Union is in the dustbin of history, we talk about STEM not so much for national security in that sort of Cold War context, but more about how we need to improve STEM education in order to be economically competitive in this global economy. Now in today's video, we're going to focus more in the things that took place during this high point of STEM conversation and actually take a look at a public policy solution to help North Carolina move itself along, become uh, a better state at preparing students for science and engineering careers. Uh, and one of the policy solutions that it tried, uh, and one that is going on even to this day, is the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics. Now, the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics was opened in the fall of 1980, just before the peak of this mid-1980s conversation around STEM education. Uh, we could talk more about the School of Science and Mathematics, but instead of talking about it, let's go visit it. The North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics, pioneer in the realm of STEM public policy. It was the first free residential math and science school, and the idea for it dates back to the early 1960s and energetic North Carolina Governor Terry Sanford. Sanford, who incidentally went on to become president of Duke for many years, had a coterie of young advisors around him to feed him good ideas. One of these advisors was a man named John Ely, who was a novelist and a communications professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He had many great ideas that he helped shepherd through the Sanford administration, including uh, summer programs for gifted students, the North Carolina Zoo, a public-private partnership to fight poverty in the state, and a residential high school and college devoted to the arts. But he also had a similar idea for a school of science and mathematics that was never implemented during the Sanford administration. The relentless hunt eventually won over enough legislative support for the school, and it opened in the fall of 1980 with about 150 juniors, to be joined the next year by another class of 150 students working up to just under 700 students over the next five years. Who came to the school? One legislator had worried that he would lose his star quarterback because he loved math and science so much. But in fact, the initial class had no interscholastic sports teams. Instead, according to a magazine article in the first class, students preferred Dungeons and Dragons or fooling around on one of the school's four computers, which it may surprise those of you with four computers currently on your personage to know was considered a bounteous cornucopia of computational power. As an academic dean put it, they gave up girlfriends and football and being cock of the walk for an unknown challenge. Governor Hunt bragged that the students of the School of Science and Math were no bookworms, they were movers and shakers. He challenged the incoming class to win Nobel Prizes that is exactly what we expect of you here, to become the best of the best. Flash forward to 1977. Newly elected Governor Jim Hunt, even more energetic than Sanford, brings Ely together to a dinner at the governor's mansion with Hunt's own team of science advisors, where Ely shares this idea of a residential high school for science and mathematics students. Hunt loves the idea, and it soon becomes his pet project. 
He and really his staff write thousands of letters to educators and scientists in the state, across the nation, to ask them about this idea, solicit their feedback. The feedback was mostly positive, but there were some concerns. From the perspective of today, with our panoply of magnet schools, charter schools, early colleges, establishing a residential high school devoted to science and mathematics might seem like a no-brainer. But back in the 1970s, there was nothing quite like it. You had the Bronx School of Science in New York, but that wasn't residential. Being residential dramatically increased the cost, and that wasn't something that the legislature looked very fondly on. Educators, meanwhile, worried that the school would take resources away from the rest of the public school system. Those who opposed the school included some of the most powerful people in education in the state, including the state superintendent, the chairman of the State Board of Education, the North Carolina School Board Association, and the North Carolina Association of Educators, which represented almost all the teachers in the state. The leading complaint that opponents organized around was that the school was elitist. As one superintendent said in a letter to the governor, the risk of developing attitudes of snobbishness and separateness at this age could be quite detrimental in future years. He thought that kind of specialization shouldn't happen until after a well-rounded experience at a comprehensive high school. A place where students experience the joys that come from being a participating member of a wholesome home environment. Others feared it would be elitist because it would only be accessible to those with lots of money. In the initial planning phases, it was decided that tuition would be free for North Carolinians, but that families would have to pay about $4,000 in room and board, an amount that was hard to scrounge up for most families. The state was, after all, one of the poorest in the country, ranking in the 40s in terms of per capita income. Critics worried that only wealthy and mostly white students would be able to attend. To address these concerns, school planners decided to eliminate the charges for room and board. To ensure geographic diversity, the legislature mandated that the student body roughly match congressional districts, which kept the school from being completely dominated by students from urban areas like Charlotte or the Research Triangle, though it did less to ensure economic diversity. The school sought to balance boys to girls, with no visitation after 10 p.m., of course. And balancing gender was no small thing for a school of science and math, two fields then, as now, overrepresented by men. In terms of racial diversity, school planners sought to balance the demographics overall in the state. Now, these concessions did drive up the cost of the school. Per pupil expenditure was estimated to run about four times the average for public high school students. It would cost less to send the state's gifted students to the nation's finest prep schools, complained one state representative when presented with the $11.2 million cost in one of the initial years. To help cover the cost, school leaders raised about $7 million in private funding, and the city of Durham decided to donate the site of an old hospital as a campus. To further address these concerns of elitism, Hunt and his administration worked to convince educators and legislators that this school of science and math wouldn't just bottle up good instruction or just be this container for elite education, but would help figure out how to teach science and math to these smart kids and then go and instruct public school teachers across the state how to do it better. In other words, it would be a sort of laboratory. Now, incidentally, that laboratory idea was also the idea behind charter schools initially that they would be this place where you could experiment with new practices that you could then diffuse into the rest of the public school system. As we will discuss in other videos, that's not exactly how charter schools worked out, but that was the initial idea. Speaking to those who were concerned that the School of Science and Math would compete against other public schools, Hunt Science Advisor Quentin Lindsay argued that it would be a complementary rather than a competitive relationship. The other reason that Hunt gave was essentially elitist, albeit elitist in the sense that any meritocracy is elitist. Hunt argued that the state needed a top-notch facility in order to train the leading scientists and mathematicians of tomorrow, as he put it. As the school came together in 1979 and 1980, Hunt emphasized the point to an even greater degree, arguing that North Carolina needed this school in order to attract new industries like microelectronics and biotechnology. The School of Science and Math might be 
the most profitable investment we ever make because it's an investment in our young minds, said Hunt in an opening ceremony in 1980. Brain power, he claimed, is the microelectronics industry most important raw material. As Hunt kept talking about the school, he began connecting it with these issues of economic competitiveness with places like Japan. Hunt complained to a group of businessmen in 1981 that compared with Japan, we are short on engineers and we're long on lawyers. The School of Science and Math would help remedy that engineering gap. So far, at least, there have been no Nobel Prize winners among the alumni of the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics, but its former students have gone on to do plenty of worthy things. The school has remained a key component of the North Carolina education system, so much so that the legislature recently decided to build a second campus in the western part of the state. And to some degree, the idea that the School of Science and Mathematics would help diffuse better instruction into other parts of the state and to the rest of the public school system has played out. Another sign of this school's success is the number of copycat schools that popped up across the U.S. and particularly in the South. First in Louisiana, then Illinois, Alabama, Mississippi, and on and on. Let's pop back to Duke and wrap things up. So, with 15 other emulators across the other states, you'd think that the North Carolina School of Science and Math should be considered a universal success. North Carolina got ahead of the curve by getting the school out there and established before the Sturm and Drang around a nation at risk really set off this national conversation about STEM education. On top of that, about 600 students a year have gotten a great education gratis, while many more across the state have benefited from the diffusion of better science and math instruction. Still, from a public policy perspective, are these residential high schools for science and math worth it? Would that money that's spent on them be better off just spread around to the existing high schools so that you get better instruction there? Unfortunately, very few scholars have even studied this question at all. Now, what might the test scores of North Carolina tell us? According to the National Assessment of Education Progress, which is considered the gold standard of comparable test data for the United States, North Carolina test scores were well above the national average in the early 2000s, which is saying something given that it's a southern state and usually southern states don't do so well on those sorts of metrics. But it doesn't really seem to suggest that the North Carolina School of Science and Math had anything to do with it since the test scores weren't all that great in the 1990s and they've leveled off since then. According to the National Science Foundation, the science and engineering workforce ranges between 6 million and 21 million jobs, depending on the definition, which is a wide split. But no matter what you use to calculate that, 300 additional graduates from the North Carolina School of Science and Math every year is only a very, very tiny drop in an ocean. Moreover, despite all the hype around science and engineering, around STEM, a scholar who rounded up all the evidence couldn't find any indication of a labor market shortage in those occupations that required a bachelor's or higher. In fact, he suggests our education system produces more science and engineering graduates than there are job openings. So then, what good is the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics? Back in 1979, the editorial page of the state's major newspaper made a qualified case for the school, arguing that it will be a symbol of educational commitment. Perhaps that's still the takeaway all these years later. The school stands as a symbol of our long-standing hopes, fears, and obsession with science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education.